Today on Under the Big Tree, how does all this voltage stuff work anyway? Find out in Ohm's Law for Electronic Musicians. Hello, and welcome to an episode on the fundamentals of electronic music. This series answers some basic questions for folks who are starting on their path of creating electronic music. It's also good for those of us who can use a bit of a refresher from time to time. So let's go learn something. Today, we're going to talk about voltage, what it is, how it works, and how it is related to modular synthesis. It seems that you can't talk about modulars for very long before voltage enters the conversation. This is because so many different aspects of modular are defined in terms of volts, which is the unit that voltage is measured in. Power for modular is measured in three different voltages, plus 12 volts, minus 12 volts, and plus 5 volts. Pitch, or note values, is measured in 1 volt per octave increments. Control voltages are exactly that, an electrical signal that measures somewhere between 0 and 10 volts, and the output amplitude or volume of a signal has a range up to 10 volts peak to peak as well. So voltage is really, really important in modular synthesis. What is it exactly? Voltage can be thought of as the pressure that pushes electrons down the wire. It is the difference in charge between two points in a circuit. The larger the voltage, the more pressure there is pushing the electrons. And the various aspects of your modular circuit react based on how much voltage it is receiving. This makes intuitive sense. A 9-volt battery is stronger than a 1.5-volt AA battery. A 5-volt output signal is louder than a 1-volt output signal. And in the agreed-upon system of pitches in the Eurorack format, a 5-volt signal sent into the frequency input of an oscillator will result in a pitch that is higher in frequency than a 1-volt signal sent to the same place. Okay so far? So let's get a little more theory going by examining two more terms, resistance and current. Once we know what those are, then we can learn the magic of Ohm's law. Let's start with resistance. Resistance is the opposition to current flow in an electronic circuit. This is not a bad thing. Resistance is merely the size of the hose that the electrons are trying to flow down. Or you can think of it as a doorway that a bunch of people are trying to get through. The bigger the doorway, the more people can go through it at the same time. Resistance is measured in ohms, which is displayed as the Greek letter omega. If you've done any DIY, then you know that there are tons of resistors in electronic circuits. Each resistor has a resistance value and is a different sized hose that lets more or less electrons through depending on the size. One thing that's important to remember is that the larger the value of the resistor, the less electrons can flow past it, not more. So, a resistance of 220,000 ohms is comparatively a much smaller door than a resistance of 10 ohms, which has almost no resistance at all. One more term to learn, current. Current represents the amount of electrons that are actually flowing. I remember it by thinking about the current of a river while standing on shore and seeing how much water is flowing past me. Going back to our doorway, how many people can walk through that door in one second? That's current. As stated above, if the door is wider, then more people can walk through at the same time. But now, let's pretend that the door is in the middle of a wide open space, where people are leisurely strolling along and walk through the door without pushing or bustling. Now, let's take that same door and put it in front of a concert venue where tons of people are pushing each other through the door to get a good seat for their favorite band. If there is more pressure for people to walk through that door, more people will go through the door at the same time, right? So, we know that the size of the door, the number of people, and the pressure pushing those people through that door are all connected together. This tortured analogy is what Ohm's law is all about. The relationship between current, voltage, and resistance is represented by the simple equation V equals IR, or voltage equals current times resistance. We can look at this as a triangle, like this. 
we can move these terms around using simple algebra. So it ends up that there are three variations of this formula that we can use to calculate any one of the values assuming we know the other two. So we have V equals IR, or voltage equals current times resistance. I equals V divided by R, or current equals voltage divided by resistance. And R equals V divided by E, or resistance equals voltage divided by current. Thus, we can see that the values of these things each affect the others. If there is less resistance for the current to flow through, we will have a lower voltage. If there is more voltage pushing the electrons down the wire and the resistance doesn't change, then the current increases. More people are being pushed through the door at once. If the resistance doesn't change and the current increases, then the voltage goes up too, because there must have been more pressure to cause the current to rise and so on. Let's talk about units of measurement for a moment. Voltage is measured in volts, resistance is measured in ohms, and current is measured in amperes or amps. Just to give you a sense of how many electrons we are talking about here, one amp is defined as 6.241 times 10 to the 18th electrons passing by a point in one second. Now, they were kind enough to make these units of measurement all work together to make the math easier for humankind. So to compare our unit measurements, one volt equals one amp times one ohm. Okay, so there's this confusing thing about the voltages we need for Eurorack. I thought you said that voltage was the pressure pushing the electrons down the wire. So then what in blazes is negative voltage? We see all the time not to switch the power ribbon cable on our module the wrong way around, or it can destroy the module by sending positive 12 volts to components that are expecting negative 12 volts. Is negative voltage something that comes from bizarro world? Nah. I was just holding out on you a little bit. You see, all circuits need a reference value called ground. Ground is nominally the return path for electrons and is necessary to complete a circuit. In battery-operated objects, like a flashlight, ground is considered the negative pole of the battery. But it turns out that voltage is a relative measurement, not an absolute one. So when we say a power line is plus 12 volts, that means that the pressure is 12 volts above the ground reference level. So a power line that is carrying negative 12 volts means that the amount of pressure is 12 volts less than our ground reference level. This means that the current will flow from ground to the negative 12 volt source. Current always flows in the direction from the highest voltage in the circuit to the lowest voltage. So here's my last metaphor, maybe. Let's pretend that we have a bunch of marbles at the top of a hill. There is a little sign there that says plus 12 V. Now, halfway down the hill, someone put another sign that says ground. And at the very bottom of the hill, we see another sign that says negative 12 V. Now, let's roll the marbles down the hill. They have a natural tendency to roll downward, right? They are heading downwards towards ground. The direction of their motion is from plus 12 volts towards ground. But wait, now imagine those marbles roll right past ground and keep going down the hill towards negative 12 volts. This is because even though there is a tendency to roll towards ground, the hill is not flat there. It continues downward. In fact, you could have put the ground sign anywhere along the hill that you wanted, because it is simply a reference point that we measure the movement of the marbles against. Alright, so here is where you may have to rewind the video a couple of times and really think about it. This certainly made my head hurt as I thought it through. Here goes. So, as current was flowing from the top of the hill to ground, it flowed towards ground, right? So that makes sense in terms of thinking about a circuit. We imagine current flowing out of the power supply, flowing through some resistors and other components on its way to ground. But what happens when the marbles keep rolling down the hill past the ground point? Well, they are heading towards the negative 12V sign at the bottom of the hill, so the direction of the marbles relative to ground has just switched. Instead of heading towards ground, they are now heading away from it. 
the marbles are moving from ground towards the point of lowest electric potential because that point, in this case negative 12 volts, has less electric potential or elevation in our metaphor than ground. And so with a negative voltage, the current flows in the opposite direction from a positive voltage. It goes from ground to the power supply rather than the other way around. If that's still confusing, just remember that current always flows in the direction from the highest voltage in the circuit to the lowest voltage, just like marbles rolling down a hill. All right, enough metaphors. Let's get back to real life. So why do bad things happen to polarity sensitive components when you reverse the power connection? If you wire up an LED backwards, it will never light up. If you wire an electrolytic capacitor backwards, it can blow up with a bang and an entertaining puff of smoke. What gives? Well, it turns out that the way that these components are designed and manufactured only allow them to work in their proper orientation. The current can only flow in one direction through the component. Otherwise, it is like a car driving the wrong way down a one-way street. Uh, I knew I was going to have some more metaphors in there somewhere. This is true with electrolytic capacitors, transistors, and diodes, all of which need the current to flow in one direction only. Other components, like resistors and ceramic capacitors, don't care what the direction of current is. Positive? Negative? It's all the same to them. So then, why do we need to use negative voltage in circuits at all? The answer is it all comes down to transistors. There are two types of transistors, NPN and PNP. One needs positive voltage to function correctly and the other uses negative voltage. So circuits that use both types of transistors need both positive and negative voltage. And guess where there are lots and lots of transistors? Inside of analog integrated circuits. They are loaded with them. That's why some ICs, like op amps, require matching positive and negative voltages to feed both types of transistors inside them. And since your rack is loaded with analog electronics, you need both positive and negative voltage to make it work. So that's a brief overview of voltage, current, and resistance for modular synthesis. I know that this stuff can be confusing, and I certainly get confused with it myself. And I'd like to make a special shout out to my friend, Mohamed Paswal, who graciously put his electrical engineering chops to work, checking the validity of this text and making helpful revisions. But we don't have to become physicists or electrical engineers to do electronic music, or even to design modular circuits. Knowing on an intuitive level how this stuff works, though, is a good thing. Understanding electron flow in circuits can help you visualize what's going on, troubleshoot, and enjoy your modular on a different level. Thanks for watching Under the Big Tree. I hope that you learned or relearned something here today. As always, if you like what we are doing here, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe. For now, this is Nick, signing off.